Reason is the certainty of being all reality. This in itself, or this reality is, however, a universal, pure and simple, the pure abstraction of reality. It is the first positivity in which self-consciousness is in its own self explicitly for itself, and I is therefore only the pure essentiality of the existent, or is the simple category. The category which formerly had the meaning of being the essentiality of the existent, and it was undetermined whether of the existence as such or of the existent contrasted with consciousness, is now the essentiality or the simple unity of the existent only as a reality that thinks. In other words, the category means this, that self-consciousness and being are the same essence, the same not through comparison, but in and for themselves. It is only the one-sided spurious idealism that lets this unity again come on the scene as consciousness on one side confronted by and in itself on the other. But now this category or simple unity of self-consciousness and being possesses difference in itself, for its essence is just this, to be immediately one and self-same in otherness or in absolute difference. The difference, therefore, is but is perfectly transparent, and a difference that is at the same time none. It appears as a plurality of categories. Since idealism proclaims the simple unity of self-consciousness to be all reality and immediately makes it the essence without having grasped it as the absolutely negative essence, only this has had negation, determinateness, or difference within it, this second assertion is even more incomprehensible than the first. That is, that in the category there are differences or species of categories. The assertion is such, as also the assertion as to any specific number of, or, uh, of species of categories, is a new assertion, which however itself implies that we no longer have to accept it as an assertion. For since the difference originates in the pure I, in the pure understanding itself, it is thereby made explicit that the immediacy, the making of assertions and mere finding of differences, is here given, and we begin to comprehend. But to pick up the plurality of categories again in some way or other as a welcome find, taking them, for example, from the various judgments and complacently accepting them so, is in fact to be regarded as an outrage on science. Where else should the understanding be able to demonstrate a necessity if it is unable to do so in its own self, which is pure necessity? In paragraph 235, and also in the paragraph to follow, we're going to see Hegel referring a lot to the categories. And since Hegel is in this broad stream of German idealism, it, it's, you know, sort of a automatic response to think that he's talking about the Kantian categories and then building off of a Kantian basis. And I think it's very important to, to realize as we move into this that First of all, category as a technical term, as, as a concept in philosophy, antedates Kant. It goes all the way back to Aristotle, uh, who has a book called The Categories. Now, what Hegel is doing in, in terms of his use of categories is neither along the same lines as Kant, nor along the same lines as Aristotle, but is um, working from within a tradition in which people would be conversant with both of those, and <clears throat> he's adding his own sort of additional views into it. He wants to think of categories not only as, um, you might say, classificatory principles or, or, or um, whatever else you, you want to conceive them of. It, it's rather difficult to, to say exactly what they would be, uh, other than just calling them categories. <laughs> Um, he, he wants to see them as something more dynamic as coming out of consciousness. They do play a, a very important structuring role, so that is similar to what's going on in both Aristotle and in Kant. For Kant, they play an absolutely irreplaceable structuring role, uh, not only for our experience of, of things, but for our, our ability to speak about them, to judge about them, and to think about them, even more importantly for Kant, to know them. Uh, now, all that said, what I want to do is very quickly look at the very start of the paragraph and then jump to the end and then go to all this, this developmental stuff that's happening that I've got charted here on the board. So Hegel starts out by saying, reason is the certainty of being all reality. We've, we've already you know, covered that quite a bit. 
This in itself, or this reality, is, however, a universal, pure, and simple. That sounds pretty good so far, but then notice what he says after that. The pure abstraction of reality. So it's not reality itself. We haven't finished with this. This universal is not what we would call a concrete universal. It's, it's an abstract universal. So he goes on and he says, it's the first positivity in which self-consciousness is in its own self explicitly for itself, and I is therefore only the pure essentiality of the existent, or as a simple category. That's what we've got over here, uh, and we're going to march our way through this. So the I as pure essentiality, or simple category, well, what is he talking about there? Well, we've, we've seen this I, in, in quotes always, come up uh, a number of times, the ich, you know, the... If you want to translate that as ego, you can. Uh, just don't read Freudian overtones into it, right? Um, it's the pure essentiality. It's the pure um, uh, Wesenheit, right? Uh, Wesenheit, we, we've, we've talked about this before. Think about that which asserts itself, that which uh, things center around, that which is important, right? Uh, or as the simple category. Now, what does he mean by category in this case? That by which we are understanding other things and classifying them. What, what's providing, you might say, structure or, or sense to them. Um, now, let's, let's skip very far ahead towards the end of the, the paragraph. Uh, and this is the, this fundamental question. How many categories are there? Why are there this, this amount of categories or these particular categories and not others? So Hegel is dissatisfied with Kant's approach to this. He says, um, the assertion as such, as also the assertion as to any specific number of species of categories, is a new assertion, which itself implies that we no longer have to accept it as an assertion. What Kant was doing was the same thing that many other philosophers do, um, you know, in Kant's terms, he calls this transcendental. He's realizing, or he's not realizing, he's, he's proposing to us what must, in fact, be the case for the things that we say, yes, this is the case, to be the case. Let me say that one more time, because I've, I've put a lot of cases into that. So, Kant is saying that we have to have the categories that we do in part because they are there, right? He's saying these are there whether we philosophers grasp them as such, that we didn't in the past, uh, or we imperfectly did so. But um, these are there and they play an important structuring role in making sense out of whatever it is that we experience, we think about, we imagine, uh, so on and so forth. We realize that by saying, well, what has to be the case for what we've got here to be as we think that it is. We're starting with, with saying, well, this is the case, and then we're sort of extrapolating, well, what has to be the case in order for this to happen? Hegel thinks that when Kant does that, there's some slippage there. It doesn't really need to be the way that Kant has presented it. So Kant makes these, these you know, very sweeping assertions, groundbreaking, you know, we talk about the Copernican uh, you know, turn in, in epistemology and metaphysics, uh, you know, the, the move away from saying, you know, let's look at the objects of knowledge to let's look at the subject, the one who's, who's knowing, um, which, you know, Kant, of course, isn't the first person to do that. Aristotle did that as well, but uh, so did Thomas Aquinas, um, so did, you know, other people, but, but Kant is doing it in a very, seri uh, very fundamental way, a radical way. So uh, Hegel goes on and he says, it's a new assertion, which implies we no longer have to accept it as an assertion. If in history there can be a particular time where Immanuel Kant comes around and says, aha, here are the categories, um, you know, these have been active the entire time, we just didn't really know it, that should raise some, Hegel thinks, alarm bells or red flags. We should, well, why didn't we know it all this time? Especially since we've had, you know, pretty smart people working on the problem. Aristotle started talking about categories, you know, two millennia ago. Um, so Hegel says we, we need to consider whether this, this assertion really ought to be accepted. And he says, um, since the difference originates in the pure eye, and the pure understanding itself, it's, it's made explicit that the immediacy, the making of assertions and mere finding of differences is here given, and we begin to comprehend. 
But, here's criticizing Kant, to pick up the plurality of categories again in some way or another is a welcome find. Taking them, for example, from the various judgments and complacently accepting them so, is to be regarded as an outrage on science. Now, he's not naming Kant explicitly, but who is it that, you know, said, well, we've got these kinds of judgments, and that tells us what kind of, what, not just what kind, but what number of categories we have. Well, it was Kant. Hegel's saying that's a little arbitrary, and why do we have to accept it like that? If we do, that's, that's in a certain way being unscientific, or if you don't like the word scientific, less rigorous than we ought to be. So he says, where else should the understanding be able to demonstrate a necessity if it's unable to do this, do so in its own self, which is pure necessity? So <clears throat> if we're going to say that these categories structure the understanding, and the understanding is that which we're using to, to make sense of everything else, uh, unless we go beyond the understanding, right, into to reason for Kant, um, there should be some necessity that is demonstrable within the scope of the understanding, and Hegel is saying that just hasn't been the case. Let's look now at this, this other middle part, right? So we started, we got to the, the beginning of this, um, the category as being the essentiality, the vasen height of uh, what's being translated here as the existent, the zionist, that which has being, that which, that which is real, that which possesses some sort of being, whatever we want to make of that. So the essentiality of the existent, the category is, is that. This is very different than when we think of Kantian categories or when we think about um, the Aristotelian categories, right? The, the ways in which we can, we can predicate things. Um, even if we confine it to the category of substance, um, it, it's, you know, where the others are accidents in Aristotle, we don't have a, a sort of unity like this. But the I that is involved in reason at this stage um, brings that to the table. And things have been somehow unified. So it looks like there's only one category at this point. One single category for all of being. Um, and, and he says there's an ambiguity here. Is it of, of the existent as such? Or is it contrasted with consciousness? Um, this is going to lead us to the, the next stage. He says... Um, category which formerly had the meaning of being the essentiality of the existent, right, is now the essentiality or simple unity of the existent, but in a very important way that reveals to us what, what progress has been made, it's the existent as a reality that thinks. So what is centering the category, or you might say the operation of categoriz categorization, right? Uh, this is this, you know, bringing of essentiality or noticing of essentiality. <clears throat> it's um, the reality that thinks. It is, that is us. We are the reality that thinks. We can think of ourselves in terms of consciousness or self-consciousness or reason or spirit, um, any of these things. But that's really, that's really human being. So he goes on and he says, um, here we go. The category means this, that self-consciousness and being are the same essence. Now I put an equal sign there, it's abbreviating a little bit. They, they are the same essence, self-consciousness and being. We are not radically cut off from the rest of being, because it is, as we've remarked, for us. So he goes on and he says, um, the same... Uh, they're the same, not through comparison, but in and for themselves. It's only the one-sided, spurious idealism that lets this unity again come on the scene as consciousness on one side, confronted by it in itself on the other. But now this category, or simple unity of self-consciousness and being, possesses difference, he says, in itself. Anything that really is, for Hegel, has already got difference within itself, working, right, itself, others. We've, we've gone through this many times. This leads us <coughs> to another stage where now we realize that because there is the category, this has to be present to us as a plurality of categories. Very interesting transition there, isn't it? So he says, the difference, um, here we go, 
Uh, its essence is to be just this, to be immediately one and self-same in otherness or in absolute difference. This is something that we saw in um, Force and the Understanding, right? This, this uh, um, you know, being the same in otherness, uh, repelling itself from itself, repelling the self-same from it, and welcoming the other, which is itself. So he goes on and he says, um, since I, it appears as a plurality of categories, and since idealism proclaims the simple unity of self-consciousness to be all reality, and immediately makes it the essence without having grasped it as the absolutely negative essence, only this has negation, determinateness, or difference within it. This this difference, right? Um, so what we end up with is this, he says, more incomprehensible assertion, which is still comprehensible, that there is a plurality of categories, and that there are, in the category, there are differences, untershida, right, um, separations, um, or species, it's translated here, or if you want to call it types, arten, uh, of categories. So, you know, is he saying that, that something like what Aristotle or what Kant was doing is, is totally off base? No. Um, they weren't the be-all and end-all of listings of the categories, in part because there's still, as Hegel feels, a kind of arbitrariness to it, and there isn't a, a you know, development uh, of it taking place. You, it's very hard to account for why do these only appear uh, in formulation very late in the game, if you think about Kant. Um, but there is a, a plurality at work, and the question that we want to determine then is, well, you know, how many categories are there, and why are those categories the categories that they are? So what we're really asking about is a kind of um, intelligibility, right? We are, we are trying to make sense out of the categories. And these all should still connect up with some sort of unity as well in that plurality. So what he's done here is, is essentially raised a problem for us. He hasn't provided us with the solution for it. He's not actually going to provide us with a, a full solution in any way in this, this section. This sort of thing is going to have to happen much later on. But he has framed the problem. Now, because in this way the pure essentiality of things like their difference belongs to reason, we can, strictly speaking, no longer talk of things at all. That is, of something which would be for consciousness merely the negative of itself. For to say that the many categories are species of the pure category means that this latter is still their genus or essence and is not opposed to them. But ambiguity already attaches to them, since in their plurality they possess otherness in contrast to the pure category. In fact, they contradict the pure category by such plurality, and the pure unity must supersede them in itself, thereby constituting itself a negative unity of the differences. But as a negative unity, it excludes from itself both the differences as such, as well as that first immediate pure unity as such, and is a singular individual a new category which is consciousness as exclusive, that is, consciousness for which there is an other. The singular individual is the transition of the category from its notion to an external reality, the pure schema which is both consciousness and since it is a singular individual and an exclusive unit, the pointing to an other. But this other of the category is merely the other first mentioned categories, that is, pure essentiality and pure difference. And in this category, that is, just in the positiveness of the other, or in this other itself, consciousness is equally itself. Each of these different moments points or refers to another, but at the same time they do not attain to otherness. The pure category points to the species, which pass over into the negative category or singular individual. This latter, however, points back to them. It is itself pure consciousness, which is aware in each of them of being always this clear unity with itself, but a unity which equally is referred to an other, which in being has vanished, and in vanishing also comes into being again. Paragraph 236 is particularly challenging 
for two different reasons that, that are connected up together. The first is that he's going to talk about the single or singular individual as being a, a new type of category. So this challenges our, our understanding of category, which you know is, is closely tied together with this, this uh, action of classification, and Kant, as Kant rightly uh, recognized, as Aristotle also recognized, uh, with, with predicating things of things, with making judgments. Um, so how does individuality fit in with that? Uh, here's the second part that makes it particularly challenging. Hegel throws it on the table, but doesn't really work that out in this section. This is one of those paragraphs where there's a lot of sort of charting things out that refer to each other, things that we're supposed to like, you know, keep in our head as consciousness phenomenologically following along with Hegel's unfolding of the history of consciousness. And we're supposed to keep all these things, you know, in our head and figure, well, what's connected to what? And, and there's no actual resolution here in this paragraph. But it is important because he is he's setting out the, the problematic. He's deepening it. So um, let's take a look at what he's, what he's actually saying. He starts out by saying, because in this way the pure essentiality of things, like their difference, belongs to reason, we can, strictly speaking, no longer talk of things at all. That is, of something which would be for consciousness merely the negative of itself. That is, everything is for consciousness in this, this area of reason. Now that we've moved past the previous stages, and so there's nothing that's really fundamentally alien to, to consciousness. Um, so things, in a certain sense, aren't things the way that we traditionally imagine them. And I'm just going to leave that slide, because in the next paragraphs to come, we're going to see some, some important discussion about, about that, particularly as we move into observing reason. Now, he says then, um, for to say the many categories are species of the pure category, that's what we've got down here, right? And there, there's more than three categories, I just didn't want to put more than three on the board. And each one of them is an, is an art, a species of category, right? Um, there's species of the pure category, the pure essentiality, the, the unity, which is, in fact, their genus. And, and we're you know, pretty familiar with this sort of mode of, of classifying things. Um, now, this led to a big problem as um, people started thinking about, well, how to classify the totality of beings and, and being. So one way that you can make sense out of this is to say that, you know, we, we start at these lower levels and we see how things are connected with each other. Um, we see that they're all part of a you know, particular species, so I'm a human being, um, you're a human being, we're not in the same species as, you know, uh, tree slug or, you know, hermit crab or something like that. But we have things in common with them, you know, living, you know, certain kinds of systems. We don't have to get too, too technical with this, but we have genuses, right? And then maybe there's like different kinds of genuses, but they should all somehow connect up with some overarching genus, shouldn't they? Uh, being, perhaps, you know, being itself, the being a being. And so, you know, that's when we can talk about some sort of pure category. What we're doing here is, is essentially metaphysics, and we're trying to figure out how things actually fit together. Hegel's going to turn things on their head very quickly here. So he says that um, the many categories are species of the pure category, and this means that this latter is still their genus and, or essence and is not opposed to them. Okay, so that's, that's a problem then if it's not opposed to them. So he says ambiguity already attaches to them because in their plurality they possess otherness. And otherness not only in relation to each other, right? This category is this category by not being this category. This is something that we saw already at the level of, you know, sense perception with, you know, um, sense certainty, right? But, but now what we're looking at is the otherness or the difference of each of these, you might say, category small c with the category large c that is supposed to be their, their unity. Uh, and again, we saw this problem with the nature of the universal already back in, in the earlier consciousness sections. So he says, 
They possess otherness in contrast to the pure category. In fact, they contradict the pure category by such plurality. So not only are they opposed as individual uh, species, they're also opposed as a whole by being a whole bunch of different things. And he says, the pure unity must supersede them in itself, thereby constituting itself a negative unity of the differences. Now, as a negative unity, he says, it excludes from itself the differences as such, as well as that first immediate pure unity as such, and we get a new thing. The singular universe, singular individual, not the singular universal, but the singular individual. It's kind of a funny slip to say singular universal because when we talk about the individual like this, we are, in a certain sense, doing something that is a universal. This is where we get to what's particularly challenging about this. How do we think individuality, which is where the whole game of doing things plays itself out, right? I'm an individual, you're an individual. How do we think this out in terms of, you know, essentiality or categories? So he says, the singular individual is a new category which is consciousness as exclusive, consciousness for whom there is an other. Uh, the singular individual, he says, is the transition of the category from its notion to an external reality. There's an externalization that's going on here. Like, for example, the fact that I can see myself, you can see me. So we, we have a very complex thing going on here because the singular individual is you, it is me, it's also, you know, us being other for each other, isn't it? But there's another other going on here as well. So he says, the other of the, of the category is merely the other first mentioned categories, pure essentiality and pure difference. And I've got those here, but that is this right here and this right here, or perhaps what's with you between them. So, what does that mean for us? He says, um, in this category, just as in the positiveness of the other, or in the other itself, consciousness is equally itself. So this is all consciousness, right? Both other and individual. So now he says, each of these different moments points or refers to one another. Each of these that we've been talking about refers to the others, so this is one big dynamic system. None of them are identical to each other, and yet none of them are totally separate from each other. And you notice I've got this arrow here, so you know, as, as the, the dynamic of this unity and its you know, negativity plays itself out, we get the singular individual. But we can also go to it this way as well, right? We can say, well, we go from the genus down to the species, and what's below a species? Well, you know, the singular individual that fits into the species. So no matter which way we go, we wind up with the singular individual there. So he says, they don't attain to otherness. The pure category points to the species, which passes over to the negative category, singular individual. This points back to them. Why? Because it's pointing back to them as its other. It is itself pure consciousness, which is aware in each of them of being always this clear unity with itself, but a unity which equally is referred to another, which in being has vanished, and in vanishing also comes into being again. So we see, you know, once again, the, the typical thing where this entire thing here is consciousness. <clears throat> We're doing phenomenology. We're saying what is present to consciousness, and what is other has this kind of strange... Uh, existence. In, in so far as we focus on it, it starts to vanish, it starts to recede, we lose our, our grasp on it. In so far as we move away from it, it attains to prominence yet once again. So, um, all of this is what we need to keep in mind moving forward.